Welcome to the aggressive life. I have the need, the need for speed. Where did that come from? Top Gun. Yes, it's an institution. And Maverick from Top Gun, really amazing. I got to say, I saw that Top Gun Dirt. Well, when did it come out? The summer or something like that? Yeah, yeah, it was a summer film. Yeah. It, it, I went in with very, very low expectations. Like, okay, this will be fine. No, no problem. But it was... If I if I could figure out that my top five favorite movies of all time, that would be my top five. Yeah, it's freaking great. It really it's is. freaking great. Wow. Wow. Today, you might be motivated to go spend some money to watch that if you haven't already. Because today we're going to have a key, key guy who was involved in Top Gun Maverick. His name is Frank Weiser. Or Frank Weiser. Because he's German. <laughs> Frank Weiser, even though his name is German, he is 100% top blue American. He's a fighter pilot, and he was the guy who's actually flying the plane during Top Gun, the most recent edition. It's made over $1 billion at the worldwide box office. It's only the 50th film in U.S. history to do so, or in history to do so. And it's due in part to our guest today, Frank Weiser. He is a literal, real-life Top Gun pilot who's flew, flown the missions that you saw depicted in the film. There's no CGI crap there, from what I understand. This man is the real deal. He's a retired U.S. Navy commander. He's a former member of the Blue Angels and the stunt pilot responsible for flying Tom Cruise in the film. While it looks like Tom Cruise is flying planes through the Twisting Canyons and top speed right above the ground, it's actually Frank. He's behind the controls with Tom Cruise in the back seat. This man has flown combat missions. He has uh, amassed thousands of hours in the air. He's got a lot to teach us today. Welcome to the aggressive life, Frank Weiser. Thank you. Good to be here. <laughs> oh man, I, I I am really I'm really surprised that we were able to land it. You've got you've got to be a podcast guest dream. I mean, everyone and their brother's got to be interviewing you, right? It has been a busy last six months. I'll say that. My word. Gosh. So, Dirt, it took us six months to, six months to land him then? You've been working for six months? Working hard. Yeah. Work, we are working hard to get Frank here. All right. So, let, let's go back to the beginning. Dirt works on all these for me. Sometimes I say, hey, get this person, that person. So, then Dirt comes up with some, which was was this one, just just fantastic. So, how, did, how do they find you, Frank? They just come to you and say, "Hey, uh, we need somebody." You'll do, or how did you get in the queue to actually be the real pilot? Well, it was. Uh, I think you're right. It was a circuitous route that that came to me. But um, what I loved about the way that they did the movie is the Navy used as many people as they could to try to spread the wealth around. And yeah. so, you know, we when you start flying, you're um, you, you've been in the Navy for six months. And then by the time you go to your first squadron, two or three years, but they're using folks that have been in five to 10 years for a lot of stuff. And it's one of the coolest aspects of the movie is that a lot of the flying you see was done by our junior guys and girls. And the fact that we did everything you see on there with very, very few exceptions was, as you said, really done. And even cooler than the fact that it was really done, it was done by our most junior pilots, which should be the most, you know, scary thing imaginable to some of our enemies out there, right? Is that our very junior people can do what they saw on the movie screen. Uh, I was involved because of the low altitude stuff. The director, the producer, Tom himself wanted a couple scenes that were at extreme low altitudes, much lower than you'd normally fly in the F-18. Traditionally for us, 200 feet is the absolute lowest you'd go. And they were looking for something down more like 10 or 20 or 30 feet high. And, and um, the way they found to crack that code was to use a former Blue Angel that had done it before. Because the current members of the Blues are too busy flying air shows every single weekend, you know, seven days a week, very busy. So I was um, still attached to the Blues and working on our new airplane and testing it for the following season. And so there was kind of a... Um, a a happy mix there that all went together. And uh, I had done it so many times for the Blue Angels. You know, the, the scene you see when he's in that Mach 10 airplane, that was me in a Blue Angel jet. And I had flown that same maneuver a thousand times at air shows. Mm. In the canyon and then the low altitude stuff, uh, it's an easy way to mitigate the risk associated with doing that. What's the difference between somebody who has been in the service flying those planes for five to 10 years and yourself? Is it a, is it a noticeable skill gap? 
No, that, well, it's um, experience is everything, especially in an airplane. So the, one of the great things about flying, especially for your country, is that the more you do it, the better you get. There's not an age necessarily where you start to get worse, but certainly in your 30s and your 40s, you were better than you were in your 20s. And so the the experience of having done it so many times, you build a sight picture. You begin to actually, your eyes become a better altimeter than the airplane does. And you develop a real keen appreciation for how low you are and then an unwillingness to accept unnecessary risk. That's interesting because having having reps, being experienced accounts for a lot. But then I also know there's something about the neurochemistry and our nerve endings that the young younger you are, the quicker that you are. It's why, you know, people have to retire from baseball in their mid thirties. They just can't get the bat around as quick. But you're saying the wisdom of how things operate more than compensates for the fibers of youth. I, I do believe so, especially in aviation. I heard somebody uh, years ago refer to a, another person say, he's an incredible pilot. He just makes terrible decisions. <laughs> you know, stick and rudder skills are nice to have, but need to have is good decision making. And so the ability to be down there, to recognize the risk associated with, to be smooth and steady and controlled because you've done it a lot uh, was a benefit. And a lot of our younger pilots could have done what I did for that movie. The admirals who had to balance the risk versus reward, went with a known quantity who had, in my case, you know, having had so much experience, 20 years of doing that same thing. So um, the first movie, if you if you know, back in 1986, a gentleman was killed filming that, Art Scholl. Hmm. And I think there was very much a good deal of attention paid to the fact that we're not willing to risk an airplane or a pilot or anyone for that matter to uh, make the movie better than it needs to be. Right. I, I read a book recently, a book is a Overstatements, a real, real short, short pamphlet that someone sent on to me by an executive coach. And his premise is that your most productive decade of your life is 60 to 70. Your most productive. And his reasoning says that is, hey, your networks are more than they ever have been. Your skill set is as high as it's ever, ever has been. And you make less mistakes than you ever have, to your point of, you know, poor stick skills. And I, th I think our, our culture is just so, so fixated with youth. We forget that. I mean, look at you right now. H how old are you, Frank? 44. All right. So you're 44. So you were, you were 40 when you actually did the, was it four years ago? When did you actually fly the film? That's a great question. We started in this fall. I started in the fall of 18 and wrapped up in the summer of 19. And the movie was supposed to be released summer of 2020. And they had, I think, four separate slides due to the pandemic. Yep. I do think to your point, though, uh, there is something noticeable about flying a fighter that does get harder as you get older, and that's the physicality of it. I think mm. it's not fair to call it a full contact sport, but it is a um, it is a athletic and a physical endeavor to fly those airplanes. You don't have to be incredibly strong to do it, but you have to be fit and you have to be mentally and physically focused and driven. And when your body is under, you know, speeds doesn't affect you, but high G's is. And so you need to have a good deal of core strength and leg strength. Um, to be able to withstand those G's. Yeah, so I've, I've heard it described by another pilot years ago that that those G's, it's massive gravity that's coming on you and you're, you're having to flex muscles while you're uncomfortable to pump blood into your head to keep you sane or how's that all work? Exactly, yeah, so it's a lot of cord. So what you'll do is in your ejection seat, you'll squeeze your end together and you'll you'll uh, tighten your stomach muscles and your leg muscles because the blood is being pulled from your head down. And as you constrict your muscles, it doesn't allow that blood to flow down, so it keeps it in your head and keeps you um, breathing and keeps you awake. And so the best thing you can do is have great core strength and, le and leg strength, which I had done a tour with the Blue Angels and then eventually went back after a mishap and uh, when I got a phone call saying it's time for you to come back, the first thing I did was I went to the gym and started doing squats because mm. I don't generally do squats as an exercise, but I, you have to do deadlifts. Yeah, because they suck. That's why they suck. <laughs> why the legs when you're in a in a fighter? I understand the core, but why the legs? Well, you have I mean, so much of your muscle mass can be in your legs and in your glutes and your hamstrings. And so it's just a big part of uh, your lower body muscle that if you tighten your upper body, like most people do that lift weights, you'll, you'll actually kind of, it's counterproductive. It forces the blood further down, mm. work the, the constricting up towards your core. And that seems to do the most. So when you're in that spot, what does a leg workout look like for you? Uh, you do leg day two or three times a week, and you do heavy squats, deadlifts, um, lunges, a lot of planks, that sort of thing. So you say squats, you're talking about like 
two sets of 10, 40, you know, 15 sets of five? What, what is it? Uh, we would generally start at like 12, 10, 8, 6, 4. Maybe if you're doing a really heavy leg day and work down like that, leg press also seems to be pretty effective. But yeah, I would do um, the workout would, leg day would be an hour long. And I joined the Blue Angels after a mishap in 2007 that involved G. And so the, the pilot that was in the crash had, did not pass out from G, but had a almost loss of consciousness. And so there was a renewed effort to uh, exercise with heavy weights six days a week, restrict some of the cardiovascular exercising, like not going out and running and doing marathons. That's counterproductive. You know, hmm. someone who does well under high G is essentially a power lifter, not a marathon runner. Yeah, I, th- I think our mentality about exercising is really starting to change. It used to be all cardio, cardio, cardio. And I think we're we're getting the clue that you, you don't go into an old folks home because you can't run an eight, eight minute mile. You go into an old folks home because you can't lift your groceries right. and, yeah. and you don't get into a, into a fighter jet because you can run a marathon. You get into one cause you can squat. That's a, that's a mind twist for many of us. A, a friend of mine who I'd climbed Mount Denali with back in college went on a few years later and summited Everest the same day I graduated from the Naval Academy. And I asked him how he prepared for it. Cause so many of the guys on Everest are, are incredible endurance athletes. And he said he did leg press more than anything else. He wanted strong legs. And this is not a professional climber, but he summited Everest first try from having strong legs. Yeah, I, I've always poo-pooed the whole leg thing for the obvious reasons, right? You, people can see your upper body. They can't see your legs. And your legs, have, my legs have always done for me what I need them to do. But now that I'm doing more backpack hunting, carrying around weight, I'm getting, you know, I've gotten a bit older all of a sudden like, man, the legs are, that's, that's the most important part of the workout. It's, it's, it's good to be reminded of that. So I'm thankful you're on the podcast just for my own personal health, because as we say all the time, it's all about me. It's all about what I want. So I'm getting what I want from you, Frank. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. All right. Let's get into some deep stuff here. Tom Cruise. Is he as short as I think he is? Come on now. You're off payroll. You don't have to worry about it. Is he as short as I think he is? I don't, I did not think he was short and we were sitting down all the time we were together for the most part, but I did, I would not have noticed after the fact and said he seemed uh, short or even um, anything other than normal. Talk about age. That dude is impressive. I mean, I know people like to crack on him for, you know, the Scientology thing or a whole bunch of things you can crack on him for. But whenever there's a man who's able to elevate his game and stay creative, stay pushing things and looks virtually the same way he did when he was 16 and he's still relevant and he's trying big things. Hats off to Tom Cruise. I, I couldn't agree more. I was quite impressed with how hard, hardworking of a guy he is. He, um, he's certainly at the top of his game, but he doesn't waste a moment of his day. So what does that look like? You show up on set, Tom Cruise come, comes out of the star trailer and just hops in the back or you having meetings about what you have to do or what he has to do? What's the, what's the onset coordination like? Yeah. So for the, there were periods where it was just a Navy pilot flying an airplane and then they would treat that like any normal flight. You'd, you'd meet with perhaps the director or the um, aviation consultant for us, but otherwise it's a normal flight. If we had an actor in the back seat, you'd brief in a large room and you'd have everyone there and you'd sit around a long table and you'd talk, you'd go through the storyline of what you wanted to accomplish the pilots would talk about, you know, the administrative aspects of coming and going, but you'd have a traditional flight brief uh, for that. And then you'd all go get dressed. You'd, you'd put on all your normal aviation equipment, your helmet, your survival vest, your G suit, that sort of thing. And then the actor would generally strap in the airplane with the help of um, the crew, because one, they're, they're not used to flying our airplane. So they had some assistance getting strapped in properly, but also while we were in that airplane, uh, an aspect that can't be ignored is the fact that they were directing, they were everything in that airplane, right? They were managing the cameras. Oh. And so they were having to uh, look at this entire panel full of cameras. The pilot would do the pre-flight, climb up in, you'd start up and off you go. But they were, um, there was no one there to say, look this way or do this or uh, get the sun angle right. They had to do all that from the back seat. Fascinating. I never did consider that before. And so how long are they in the seat for on a, on a trip you're doing? A traditional ride that, that I was a part of was about an hour to an hour and a half. And you'd keep shooting the same thing over and over again while you're up there to try to get it exactly right. And, and the other trick for that movie was there'd be days where you'd, you'd shoot um, essentially the same scene on different days. Uh, it didn't, wasn't necessarily exact. They would splice different portions together, but the sun, the environmentals, everything had to be the same. Yeah. They, they did, I thought the editors did a great job of marrying up 
a year's worth of flying all to make it look fairly consistent. You mentioned a Mach 10 plane, F-16, F-18, F whatever, whatever. Give me a, give me a quick Cliff Notes understanding of the different um, jets there are, the errors they were in, all that kind of stuff. Would you mind? Sure. So the Navy jets they focused on was the Super Hornet, which is the F-18 E and F. And so an E is a single seat and F is a two seat. Okay. They created that airplane, the test plane he was working on, the Mach 10 airplane. I think they call it the Dark Star. And so that's not a flyable airplane. So they had that an airplane entirely built, the, the size you'd expect, but it only could um, stay on the ground. And so what they did was they used that for all the filming, and then they used the Blue Angel airplane that I was in to create the effect of the takeoff when we when they um, when Tom flew over Ed Harris and essentially dusted him as he was launching for his test flight. That was all done with the real airplane. That way the effect is normal, but, and then they CGI'd the Dark Star um, overlaid. I guess, on my Blue Angel airplane. So the F-18 is what's in production right now, or what used right now. F-16 was like what year to what year? When did the F-16 go away and the F-18 come in? That's the only difference there is that's an Air Force airplane. Oh. The biggest difference is it lands on an aircraft carrier. And so to land on a ship at sea, you, you one, you add a tail hook because it this hook grabs the wire, but you also have to increase the, uh, the landing gear uh, capabilities. An F-15 or an F-16, which are Air Force planes, you'd notice they have traditional wheels on them and landing gear assembly. If you looked at an F-18 or a Joint Strike Fighter that's at the boat, you'd see that they it looks like they're they're built starting at the wheels up. If you're landing at 720 feet per minute. It's essentially a controlled crash. You hear that said a lot. Let's talk about landing on an aircraft carrier. You said it's a controlled crash. It looks intense from movies. Describe it. What do, what do you have to think about going into a aircraft carrier versus a concrete pad? Yeah, I would say the, the biggest difference is you're totally focused. Uh, much like the focus that's required to film the movie as we did, it, um, when you're the last 15 to 30 seconds before you land on the aircraft carrier, it is a level of focus that doesn't have any um, comparison, in my opinion. And especially when we do it at night, and especially when you do it in bad conditions, right? Daytime flying around the aircraft carrier is, once you get good at it, it's fun and it's exciting and it's challenging, but it's um, it's not something that would necessarily get your heart going too, too much. But nighttime at the aircraft carrier, it's pitch black and it is challenging. Uh, and you get set up on a long straight end to land on the boat, but the boat is moving away from you. Because if you were to look at an aircraft carrier, mm. area where you land is about 10 degrees off of the way the ship is moving. So if you were to look long for the runway, you're essentially your runway is leaving you the entire time. It's moving to the road. And of course the ship moves up and down too. If you're in rough seas, the entire ship is um, going in and out of the water. So your entire runway is not just moving left and right, but it's literally moving up and down. So it is, uh, it's something that the Navy, it amazes me to this day that we do it as safely as we do considering how challenging it is. And you're saying there's no lights. There's no tracer lights at all on the on the aircraft well, we'll carrier deck? keep it almost totally dark, and that's for the benefit of everyone working on the flight deck that they maintain their night vision. Mm. You truly don't even see it that there's a ship out there until you're a few miles away and you just basically get one or two lights that tell you whether you're lined up left or right of course, and those lights hang off the back of the ship. And then you have to be within a mile of it, which means you know, you're 15 to 20 seconds prior to landing before you even recognize any lights on the flight deck. Wow. That's awesome. It's incredible, actually, that it's done all the time. And the thing is, it, it's definitely not just the pilot. A pilot by themselves could not land on that ship the way it is. It is, uh, I'd say it's more like a football team where every single person has to do contribute or the play won't be successful. So you have 6,000 people on that aircraft carrier to project the power of maybe 50 or 60 fighters ashore. And everybody has to be on their A game or it won't work. And when you miss a landing with the aircraft carrier, do you have enough time to gun the engines and still take off again, or you miss it and you're done? No, you sure, thank goodness, no. Um, you definitely, every time you land, you go to full power. Hmm. And the idea is there that if you, you're not going to pull the ship along any faster. You catch the wire, you come to a stop. You know, there's the old joke about the first time the pilot lands, or if you, if you get really behind the airplane and you're struggling and you land and you're just overcome by events, It'll, it might be a second before you pull the power back, even though you've stopped. And the captain will come up and say, you can go ahead and power back. You're not getting us there any faster because you're putting out 30,000 pounds of thrust but behind a 100,000-ton ship with nuclear power plants in it. <laughs> if maybe you do everything right and your hook just skips over the wire, you've got to have enough power on the air ch airplane so that you take back off again. So you're coming in, unlike when I'm flying passenger on Delta – you can hear them cut off the engines the last minute. They come in. You're never cutting off. Any, it's full power landing the whole time. 
We're probably in the low 80% if you were to do it on a 100% scale. Okay. You have to have some power on. You'd never come to idle. But if you, if thankfully airplane's strong enough that if you went full power, you would climb. You wouldn't, you wouldn't descend to land. But the minute you touch down, you definitely go to full because we call it bouncing. So you, when you, instead of doing um, touch and goes, like most pilots will go out and practice touch and goes, we call it, we practice bounces because you touch down and immediately bounce back off because you go to full power. Oh, only men. I know, you, I know there's great women pilots. I know that that's for sure. But if we go back to world war two before it, it's only men who would go, Hey, I got a good idea. Let's get a boat and let's float a boat. And I bet we can land a plane on a boat. <laughs> who's the first guy who's doing that? Oh my gosh. Crazy. It is crazy. And, um, and the first person that did it, I think it was in 1911, but literally wrapped like bicycle, um, bicycle inner tubes around himself. <laughs> it is really remarkable that the, the heroes who came before us that were able to make this thing what it is. Are you looking for something to help grow your spiritual muscles in 2023? I want to suggest you might want to check out my devotional for men called Move a guide to get up and go forward. These are the conversations I have again and again and again and again and again with guys having coffee, having beers, or sitting around a campfire. It's core content that man after man is found helpful to get them to a new place. Right now, it's 50% off on Amazon. For nine bucks and change, you can put 70 days of practical spiritual teaching and application in your hands and in your mind, and in your heart, and in your limbs. And it makes a great gift for the hard to buy for a guy. Head over to Amazon right now and get your copy of Move. Then drop me a line and let me know what you think. Today's podcast is brought to you by Athletic Greens. It's a product I use every day. I started taking AG1 because... I don't watch my diet too closely, but I know that I'm getting all the vitamins, minerals, and nutrients I can, as well as hydrating with 12 ounces of water right off the bat at the beginning of the day. One scoop of AG1 has got 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens, and it doesn't taste like it. It actually tastes great. AG1 is a micro habit with big benefits. For less than $3 a day, you can take care of your health and invest in your future. It's recommended by professional athletes, health experts, and me. (laughs) To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packets with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash aggressive life. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash aggressive life to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutrition insurance. So go get you some and let's get back to the show. And when you did this, um, the, the Top Gun stuff, what happens? Tom, Tom Cruise just calls his local senator and says, hey, can you uh, find me some Navy jets and a pilot? Or what's the red tape to go through to have the Pentagon cooperate? I would assume the Pentagon's cooperating with this. Very much so. I mean, we were we were renting Paramount Navy airplanes, and it was at a very high dollar amount, I think twelve dollars or $13,000 per flight hour, Paramount paid to use our airplanes. There's a very much a benefit to the Navy though, because from a recruiting perspective, a great deal of the people I've served with for my career joined because of Top Gun. Really? Oh, very much so. And the new movie, I hope, will give us 20 or 30 more years of, you know, finding young men and women who are five or six years old. And now 20 or 30 years later, they're still, they're in airplanes. Uh, I can't tell you how many people I've had say to me that their daughter's dressed up as Phoenix, who is, that's uh, the character played by Monica Barbaro. And Monica is an, is an incredible gal anyway, but the character she played is, is actually more representative of our normal squadrons because we very much have females in our squadrons now. We didn't back in 86, if few, if any, but um, it's going to open up the playing field for a lot of people, men and women uh, across the board for our pilots 20 years from now. And I really do think it matters to catch them at six or eight or 10 um, rather than 18. You know, you get to a point if you haven't, if nothing's motivated you or pushed you and you're already leaving high school, then you probably aren't going to find yourself on a track to go to college and get commissioned so that you can fly airplanes for the military. Well, that probably gives me even more respect for Tom Cruise. Uh, 
you know, he was a producer of that movie, right? I mean, he was the, he was the visionary for that movie. And I just think about getting into a situation where you go, okay, I'm going to rent something for twelve to $13,000 an hour. It's not just the idea of reviving the Top Gun franchise. It's all of the risky moves, you know, risky business, actually. <laughs> I remember those first big breakout movie. You get that dirt? You're too young dirt to remember risky business. Yeah, I think, I think I'm too young for that. Yeah. You, you, you seriously don't know risky business? I mean, I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. <laughs> uh, well, dirt. You you got to grow up. Be the right, the right. right. I'm gonna have to go rent it, I guess. Yeah, but he um he for him to like have that level of vision, that's impressive. Yeah, for sure. They had. I mean, I, that movie took a long time of planning with the highest levels of Navy leadership, certainly naval aviation leadership, to get it off the ground. So what happens? They have an admiral on set, and they tell the admiral, "Hey, can we get another plane?" And he calls up somebody and just brings in another plane or you got to, I mean, it's got to be a massive amount of logistical planning for something like that, right? It was. There was a Navy liaison for the movie who's an incredible guy. His name was called Sons Ferg. And he was sort of the man behind the scenes that just made sure the airplanes were available. The pilots were available. We had the right locations. I mean, Paramount brings in a staff that's, that's really, really impressive. Um, but then the Navy has a staff too. And we also liaise with our, we call them public affairs officers, but they are our liaisons for the Navy and the media, basically. So those people were involved as well. I understand your your call sign is walleye. Why? Tell us about it. Uh, oddly enough, it's a play on uh, a movie called Hot Shots, which was a, a parody of Top Gun back in the 80s too, a Charlie Sheen movie. And there was a character that had walleye vision and he wore these big, thick glasses, and he had to get way too close to things to see them. And when I was in my first squadron, uh, the people I was flying with thought I was flying too close, and so they um, coined me walleye. Thankfully, on the Blue Angels, that's sort of encouraged, and so the, the years I spent there, we liked flying really close. In a normal Navy squadron, though, you're not traditionally doing that. You would rarely do you ever fly close to another aircraft. When you're on your way to and from, let's say, an aircraft carrier to Afghanistan, you're miles away from each other because it gives you more ability to not – you can focus on other things, setting up your weapon systems, your navigation, talking on the radio, rather than being solely focused on who you're next to. In the Blue Angels, if we're flying in close formation, you literally never take your eyes off the person you're flying off of for even a moment, not, not even a quarter of a second. It, that level of formation flying in three dimensions takes that level of focus. Yeah, you're flying how far apart with the Blue Angels? The closest mirror is 18 inches, but it's, it's one where you could be, you're, you're sitting, of course, in an injection seat and you're strapped in in 10 different points and the canopy, you deliberately move your seat till it's one fist above your head. And so the glass of your canopy is, is one fist high. And if you were to remove that glass, you could literally do a pull up on two other airplanes at the same time. If, if you're blue angel number four in that maneuver, it's nuts how, how close they fly. And so you can, um, you can imagine, and, and that's at 300 or 400 miles an hour when you're getting bumped around. So that is a, that it really, it's a trust thing, not even a control thing is that you are um, trusting the other pilots and the other airplanes around you to respond as you would expect. Are you still flying right now? I don't fly for the Blue Angels anymore. I fly, we have a, I manage an airport in North Georgia. So it's a mountain flying community where everyone who lives in here is a pilot and they have airplanes and we have our own private runway. And I have a Baron, which is a small twin engine airplane. And then I fly Gulf Streams part-time as a um, contract pilot. So do you feel like being an F-18s and now not, does that feel like, okay, now I just got to do boring stuff the rest of my life? Or do you feel like oh, that prepared me for what I want to do for the rest of my life? What is that mentality wise? I don't even know if it prepared me, but I sure enjoyed doing it. And so I, we try really hard in our family just to be grateful, not to want more. And so I feel like uh, I'm very grateful for the 20 years I had in the military. Um, it doesn't mean I wanted to serve 20 more necessarily. There are other things out there that other challenges and other, uh, one of the hardest parts of the military is your time gone. And so my children were born born two of the three births I missed and a lot of the first I had missed. And so I wanted to be, the scales were um, tipped to a point where I felt like I was being less of an active father and more of a naval officer. So that was what caused me to get out when I did, but that's after 21 years. But I was really grateful that uh, not just serving, but the people that I worked with, it really puts it in perspective. The men and women who I served with are so incredible, almost to a person that I'm struggling in the outside world not being able to be surrounded by people of that caliber. Yes. Right. So do you feel then like the rest of your career, you're never going to be able to measure up to what you had those first 21 years? 
No, I hope not. I think there are other ways to serve. It's important to me that we keep serving myself and our family. Um, and, it, you know, flying an F-18 is not really a skill set that you can apply to other things. I mean, there are, there are benefits. You have situational awareness, you have focus, you have a level of discipline and physicality. But um, it, flying the F-18 is a lot more challenging than flying a Baron, like I said, or flying a Gulfstream. So if you can do that well, then you should be able to do the rest well. So in that sense, it does prepare you. Um, I I didn't want to be a professional pilot for the rest of my life, though, and just, you know, fly airplanes all day, every day. But I do enjoy it. And we're in the middle of real estate development, building homes and building hangars. And there are a lot of days where I stop and look up and say, man, I'd rather be flying today, actually. Yeah, right. Exactly. And I didn't want to do it. When I went to the Naval Academy, I wasn't expecting to be a pilot. Um, But and I saw it wasn't as if I started as a young kid saying I have to do this in my life. But the minute I did it, I absolutely loved it. And there's just something about it. that I don't think you'd find a pilot who says they don't love flying. Everybody loves it. And uh, there's a really cool movie done by a friend of mine about a runway in Van Nuys. And he interviews pilots at this runway. And one of them was talking about his logbook where he logged each one of his flights. And he said, it's not in his mind, it's not a logbook, it's a love letter. And, um, and that book to him is just a story of his life, of the love of his life, of all these amazing flights he's had. I don't want to ruin the movie. Those who haven't seen Top Gun, this will not ruin the movie at all, but it gives a pivotal scene. I want to get the, the skinny behind. <clears throat> you know, the movie is, have a very, very difficult mission. Tom Cruise is trying to train people for that mission. And it, they think it can't be done. And then he shows up out of nowhere and he flies the mission without them knowing he's going to do that and blows blows people away like, oh my gosh, can't believe this happened. That mission, that fl- I don't know if you call it a mission or a flight, flight plan, flight pa- path, whatever it is, that thing from start to finish, was that a real possibility to do that? Oh yeah, we did it. That was- that was my next yeah, question. There's nothing about, about that scene that was faked. Every single thing we flew. That's amazing. And so, so when you when you were in the when you were in that plane, was it just okay? I got to do it the first time. Bam, bam, no problem. Or was it like three times? I got it in the third time. No, what we actually did, and I had come out there to fly with Tom at a low altitude, so that um, we could kind of recreate what I had done in a single seat airplane. And uh, while we were out there, he said, "You know, I'd like to fly this canyon with you." Before I flew with Tom, I flew with. The actor who um, goes by Hank, the call sign Hangman. Mm-hmm. I flew with his name is Glenn Powell, and I flew with Glenn the first time. And what the director told me was, you don't need to go as low as you absolutely can. You can stay a little bit higher. It's going to fit our storyline. Which then, once you see the movie, you see that the other um, pilots couldn't quite get down low enough, or do the course fast enough, or whatever the case was. So Glenn and I flew it a handful of times together, and then Tom and I went out, and we didn't. It wasn't just one day. We did it two or three times, and when we'd go out for a sortie or the flight, you you could run through that canyon four or five or six times on one tank of gas. And so we did it a whole bunch of times. And the thing was, we kept going back until we had the sun angle right. And that's when I said, we're filming this over multiple days. It had to then be tied into um, part of the other portions where it all worked, right? And so we, we flew it a lot. Tom was uh, very much as low as we can go, as fast as we can go, the most aggressive you could possibly do it. Let's do it. He seemed to have no fear. He had total trust that, that we were going to keep ourselves safe, but he, the, the more aggressive, the better. And then even the portions where you'd normally be straight and level while you're flying through this canyon, he wanted to be in a you know 90 degree angle of bank AG turn. So it took probably two minutes. Well, the movie is pretty accurate, you know, two minutes and 15 seconds. It took about that to run through that canyon. And it feels like sprinting an 800 meter dash and, you know, on the track team in high school or something, because you come out of it, it you're, you're gassed, you're absolutely gassed. And there was something in the trailers um, prior to the movie coming out where you see Tom pull his mask off and he's breathing hard. And you can hear me on, on our intercom saying, it's a hell of a workout or it's a heck of a workout or something along those lines, because you, you come out of that thing and just, <sighs> you've been under high G the whole time. You're working for it. So he had to be in the same physical condition you were in to just be able, able to sit in the passenger seat? Definitely. I think Tom's in a far better condition than I'm in, but there's definitely a conditioning for flying airplanes. And it'd be a thing where if I only run three miles a couple times a week and then go run with a marathoner, he's going to leave me in the dust. I wouldn't be able to keep up, right? And so it's not really fair if, if all I do is fly fighters at high G, you could get someone who's in incredible condition and they might not be up for that, but Tom was for sure. Well, I haven't seen you shirtless uh, so I don't know exactly what kind of condition you're in, but you look like you're not as ripped as Tom Cruise. But what I've learned is just because you're ripped, that 
that really doesn't mean much in the real world. Like the, I just got back from a backpack. I, I hunted three weeks backpack hunting, two in Idaho, one in Colorado, very extreme conditions, burning 4,000 calories a day uh, during the one week intent. And if I had a six pack, I would have died. I needed, I needed the fat reserves to be able to live. I just, you, you wouldn't, if you were on razor thin margin physically, which would you got to be on to have that, that rip thing, you just wouldn't be as physically competent. And so, um, I, that, I meant that as a compliment to you. I didn't, I didn't assume that, I didn't assume that no, yeah, Tom totally Cruise agree. was going to be a stellar pilot, you know? No, he's just, I, I definitely think he works hard and, and exercises a lot. And to keep, my point is he stays in such a condition that even jumping into a fighter with me where I do it every day, he made it you know, look easy. And we were, there was no limitation of Tom. You know, we were, the two of us were only limited by what the airplane could do. That's amazing. Uh, to be able to have yourself in shape that your body can do what you needed to do when you don't even know it's going to need you to do that. that that's pretty cool. That is, you're exactly right. Have you ever seen the old school movie? I'm sure this is, you'll be offended by this question, but have you ever seen the old school movie, The Right Stuff? I have. <laughs> you're, you're smiling. Uh, that's that's a, uh, gosh, dudes, ladies, It's a. I think it's a great movie. It's a fantastic movie about the beginning of jet airplanes and Chuck Yeager and the moon, all that kind of kind of, I thought it's fantastic. Is it a good movie? Is that true to story, true to reality or not? Uh, I think it's, as true as it can be, you know, part of the thing, and they said this about Top Gun 2, is that um, if we made it the way we wanted to as Navy pilots, then it wouldn't be a movie. It would have been a documentary and no one would want to see it. And so we have to allow a little bit of artistic creativity. We have to give them some license to do things that are, you know, corny or not entirely accurate because that's what makes people go see the movie. And all the cheesy lines from the original Top Gun movie that are quoted like you started off the podcast with, no one says that. But if, um, if we just talked about what we talk about all day, people wouldn't go, you wouldn't make a billion bucks, that's for sure. Right, completely right. I I have always admired Chuck Yeager from what I've known about him and saw him as a young young kid, you know, maybe arguably the the, the country's best or at least best known test pilot. I'm wondering in the world of top flight pilots like you, are there certain people that are, have achieved godlike status, like a Chuck Lay, uh, Chuck Yeager, a, an Armstrong, an Aldrin, uh, whatever. Are there certain people that, that in your craft, you all say, man, that guy, that was the stud? That's a great question. I don't know that I've, I can't think of anyone. There are certainly people I've flown with who I think are incredible. I don't know, though, in the last 20 or 30 years that there's anyone who stands out as being really an incredible military pilot. But certainly the, everyone you just mentioned, they're well known as not just pilots, but explorers and taking aviation to outer mm. space. Right. And it wasn't it. They were only going to send the very best to do that. They wouldn't you wouldn't send your average pilot to go to NASA and, and then fly shuttles and and um, that sort of thing. However, uh, it wasn't just them being good as them being willing to take risks and to put themselves into those um, capsules and those space shuttles to accept a level of risk with so many different moving parts. And you're so far away from the earth, you can't, it's like this in airplanes too. You know, if your car malfunctions, you just pull off to the side of the road. You don't worry about it. It's going to be an inconvenience, but it's not scary. If your airplane malfunctions, it becomes a bad day really fast, depending on what the malfunction is. And that's what pilots are paid the big bucks for it's to handle all the things that go wrong, not to just take off and land. And so then that same jump that goes from a car to an airplane, I think it's at least that big of a jump up to a space shuttle that if things go wrong up there, man, no oh man, I, I just can't fathom what they're the position they're put in. So um, I think they're heroes just for the, the risks they're willing to take. Yeah. Cause your plane isn't gliding down to safety if the engine goes out, right? That's right. Yeah. And, and, and my plane has an injection seat, a space shuttle. You can't watch things go, go wrong and then just eject and say, oh, we'll sort this out later. Um, but I certainly can. At any altitude I'm flying, I can always get out of the airplane and um, live, to, live to fight another day. But it's not the case for, for that. And so the people you just mentioned as, as legends, I do think they're legends for sure. Uh, I just don't know if we've, if we've created new legends in the last 20 or 30 years, maybe. The scene in Top Gun, the most recent one, where the plane, the enemy plane, was flittering around in the sky doing a bunch of 360s, uh, you know, spinning around. That was real? 
Well, so that's computer graphics. We didn't fly against a um, fifth gen fighter. However, it is the airplane can do that. Really, the Air Force airplane, the F twenty two, has thrust that can be directed not necessarily on the axis of the aircraft. And so it is an incredibly maneuverable airplane. And the new fighters are all incredibly maneuverable. That's nuts. It is nuts. Yep. All right, Frank Weiser, we come, Weiser, we come to the time for our lightning round. Like real fast, lightning fast dancers. You should be able to handle this as a jet pilot. This is the round where I give you a topic and you quickly, like, like one or two sentences, answer it. Are you up for the challenge, Frank Weiser? Let's give it a go. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Biggest surprise being a part of a blockbuster film. Uh, well, okay, well, I'm surprised by how hard the actors work. I'm surprised by how great everybody at Paramount was to work with. And I'm, I'm grateful and pleased the movie was a hit. All right. Secret to maintaining control at high speeds. Focus. Absolute total focus. All right, let me pause here. You're, you're, you're obeying the rules like a good military man. <laughs> good for you. You're doing a good job. <laughs> so let me, let me just blow this out. When you say focus, does that mean you're focusing your eyes on a specific thing? Or does that mean... Any other mental thoughts are gone. What do you mean when you say focus in this context? Yep, the latter there, that uh, you're thinking only about the, exactly what you're doing at that moment. That you, uh, we call it uh, compartmentalization, that you get in that airplane and you, f you let go of anything else that might be on your mind and you focus only on the task at hand. Do you intentionally let all those other thoughts go or do all those other thoughts naturally go because you're in such a high stakes life or death situation? At first you have to um, force them out perhaps, but then it's, it's, it's like a skill like speed reading or something where the more you get, the more you practice it, the more you do it, the better you get at it to the point where it's just a natural state for you. When that, when the canopy comes down, you're compartmentalized and focused. My answer to that question is you have you know, compartmentalized to the point where you're not thinking about anything, but even in that moment, you are totally focused on what you're doing. And at flying at that low of an altitude, if something had happened to the airplane, I just climb. I'll sort it out later, but I get away from the ground because the ground is the biggest threat. Mm, that's good. I always try to think when I'm talking with someone like you, what things from your physical world are applicable to my world or the physical world are applicable to the spiritual world? Like I said, that, that, that focus, like, do I have a focus problem? Makes sense for you on a plane, but do, am I not focused enough? That's a great one there too. Like get altitude, get higher. When you get higher, you have, you have room to make mistakes instead of just always being at the bottom. That's, that's fantastic. Yep. I agree. All right. You're a husband, you're a father of three <clears throat> back to the lightning round. What aggressive moves are you making in your family at home? I think probably having to tell my kids no. I found the hardest challenge as a parent is to, um, you want your kids to be happy, you want them to be satisfied, you want them to, um, but more important than that is you want them to be successful contributing adults. And so to, to tell them something they don't wanna hear even though you know it's best for them and the older they get, um, the more frustrating it can be for them, whether it's not letting them on social media or restricting them from being around someone or doing an event, you, you know you're hurting them in the sense that you're preventing them from doing something they want, but you also know it's the best thing for them, even though they can't realize that yet. I actually, I was, I was giving one of my kids a hard time and they said, at least you're preparing, you're stealing them for the, the real world by, um, by being hard on them. And I, I said, I, I don't know if I was intending that or not, but I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I, boy, I, I think, um, I'm just glad World War II happened in 1941 because if, if we went to war right now, we would get our asses kicked, you know, <laughs> unless we were fighting the Germans of 2021 as well, you know, or 2022 as well. We, uh, well, I, I just don't feel like we're as hardy as we used to, used to, or is that just because I'm getting older? What do you think? Uh, no, it feels that way to me too, but I've also served with some men and women who are just absolutely incredible and, um, and have you know, the word, the buzzword of the day is grit, but they have just the, the toughness, the desire, the willingness to do it. But that was kind of my comment earlier that the caliber of people I felt like I'd been around were, it was so incredible that I don't know that that um, translates evenly to the, the rest of the world, but 
I do agree with you, although I'm caveating that by saying there's some people I've met who are just some of the most incredible people in the whole world and the toughest folks you've ever met. Yeah, I've, I've heard that regularly from people who are in the military. It seems like it's an environment that's a bit more homogenous, and I don't mean in terms of race and religion. I just mean in terms of a base worldview of good, evil, how you determine right and what's wrong. And I've, I've heard from a number of people who just really miss that when they come into just the cacophony of sounds and voices in modern day America. You lose that when you come out of the military. Is that true? Uh, I, I think that's a true statement. That's, that's been my experience at least. Yeah. What's the, what's the biggest aggressive mistake you've ever made? I feel like I make so many mistakes on a regular basis that not one particular one stands out as being an aggressive mistake. Um, and it probably wouldn't even be in flying, uh, even though that's what we're talking about today. Uh, to me, the best thing, what I really love about the Navy is that we tolerate mistakes and that the only thing that's required is you learn from them and you make a nice correction and you move along and you turn that mistake into a overall plus meaning that the situation is now better for you having made the mistake. But I can't think of one that was that reigned supreme over the rest. Frank, is there anything you want to talk about today that we haven't talked about? No, I think you've given me a chance. I, I use, um, to me, some of these events that I've done where I've been allowed to talk about Top Gun. It's really just a chance for me to share what's more important to me and that service to my country. And so Top Gun Maverick happens to be the shiny object, and there's a lot of attention around for good reason. But what's really incredible is that, like we said, the people you saw in those airplanes were Navy pilots flying these aircraft and doing incredible things with them. And um, it was really flown by people who are serving their country. And they're, I'm, I know they're as proud of their service as I am. So I like that it has given me an opportunity to share why I felt called to serve and why I was grateful that I had the opportunity to do so. Because that's really what it comes down to is the movie gets all the attention, but at this exact moment that we're sitting here doing this podcast, there are men and women flying off aircraft carriers at, in the dark at night into enemy country. And they're not getting a whole lot of attention, but they're the ones who deserve it. I think that's what turns me on to the military. I never served in the military. I wish I would have. Most of us who didn't serve realized there would have been some benefits to having served. One of them is just a clear conscience to say something, what you just said, which I don't want to get lost serving your country, serving your country. There's just not a lot of people interested in serving their country. There's people who are entitled for what their country wants to give them. There's people who are upset about what this, that, but just that phrase, serving my country. You just don't find that today in the average citizen. It's just really sad. Yeah, I do think um, freedom is sort of enjoyed equally by all of us, but it's not necessarily earned equally. And so the men and women right now who are not home, who are putting themselves in harm's way for the benefit of everyone else, like I said, I'm just grateful that they're doing it. Yeah, and I'm not even talking about serving my country only for the military, though that's a way to do it. I just mean serve my country in the way I conduct myself as a citizen. Like when I go to vote, am I voting to serve my country or am I voting because I want this person to give me all the things that I want? It's a, it's a real mental shift, you know? Service is just not something that's thought about. It's, I want to get, I want to receive. I don't, I don't want to give. Jesus said, Jesus said, um, freely you have received, freely give. And I'm just not seeing many of us really be on the, on the giving side of the equation, like, like you were and are with the military. Well done. Thank you for your service. Thank you. All right, Frank, is there anything you want to point us to for someone to follow up with you? Is there uh, books, social media pages, anything else? This is your time to give yourself an advertisement. Uh, no, I'm not on social media. I deliberately keep a low profile. So I appreciate that. That's a kind offer. Um, I'm just happy to be a part of it with you. And uh, thank you for having me on. That's great. All right. Hey, I hope you heard something here from Frank Weiser that makes sense for your life. Very few of us are ever going to be in the cockpit of an F-18, but I'll tell you what, the lessons here are significant. I'll just name some off the top of my head. Here's one. Stay in shape. You never know what's going to come down the pike. Stay in shape. Stay physically present. Take care of yourself physically. Here's another one I'm thinking of. Elevation. Don't stay down low where everything else is and there's really low margins for air. Elevate yourself. Elevate, elevate your game. Get higher. 
Here's another one. Think about the long-term future of your life. Tom Cruise has done that. He's thought about his long-term future. Frank has done that with where he is managing an airport. Are you thinking about your long-term future or are you just thinking about the day-to-day? The weenie boys and weenie girls always think about today because that's all they can think about. There's no vision. There's nothing out there they're pressing towards. I've gotten that from you today, Frank. Thank you very much for building into me and the rest of the Aggressive Life team. We'll see you next time or we'll hear you next time, or you'll listen to me next time on The Aggressive Life. Awesome. Right on. Hey, thanks for listening. For all things aggressive living, why don't you head over to bryantome.com. Find my new book, Move, a guide to get up and go forward, as well as articles and much, much more. And no matter where you listen to podcasts, why don't you take a second And leave us a rating. Leave us a review. It really, really helps us drive new listeners to the show. We want to help as many people as possible, just like we may have helped you. We want to help others. So why don't you help us out? And if you want to connect, find me on Instagram, at Brian Tome. Aggressive Life with Brian Tome is a production of Crossroads Church, Cincinnati, Ohio.